Google's Trends page allows you to see how many people are searching for different terms through their search engine. If you take a look at how many people are looking for gym memberships, you get a graph that looks like this. Now you can probably guess what the spikes are as you go along this graph. Every year on January 1st, there's a big spike in the number of people looking for gym memberships. There are twice as many people looking for memberships in January than there are in April. But as we know, not all of these people fulfill their intentions to start a new exercise plan. Lots of people start the year with a goal, but we know so many can't keep it up. Some people think the problem is a lack of motivation. They think that if people had stronger reasons for exercise, they'd get moving more easily. The problem is that these intentions for exercise aren't a great predictor of people's behavior. One study found that 55% of people with good intentions didn't translate that intention into action within six months. People said they were going to exercise, but more than half of them did nothing about it. Intentions are necessary, but they're not sufficient for physical activity. This means you need them, but they're not enough. People with no intentions rarely do any exercise, but just because people have intentions doesn't mean that they act on them. There's a big gap between thinking about exercise and actually doing something about it. In this video, we're gonna talk about two issues that might explain this gap, intention activation and intention elaboration. Intention activation means that people focus on short-term benefits instead of the long-term ones. For example, imagine someone's weighing up TV versus exercise. In the short term, TV seems easy and relaxing, and exercise might seem kind of hard and sweaty and stressful. You and I know that it reduces stress in the long term and improves health, but the short term benefits of TV can be more attractive. To use the jargon of intention activation, the client's context, like easy access to Netflix, activates their intention to that behavior. A different context, like a persistent friend suggesting you keep coming for a walk, might activate an intention instead for exercise. The other process we'll talk about today is intention elaboration. Intention elaboration describes the fact that it takes many steps to finish most goals. The intention needs to be elaborated for success. For some people, it's not as simple as go to the gym. For beginners, it might involve buying exercise gear, finding a gym, signing up, getting a health assessment, getting a fitness program, learning the program, and then finally making a habit of going to the gym. Some people don't follow through with intentions because they haven't elaborated on the steps in the middle, so they get stuck really quickly. So intentions may not translate into behavior for a few reasons. Maybe they weren't detailed enough, and maybe other things got in the way. So what can we do about these problems? Some people suggest that action plans or so-called implementation intentions can help people activate and elaborate their intentions. There are a few main types of implementation intentions. They can be what's called if-then plans that help people plan what to do in response to a specific trigger or so-called situational context. A situational context is something in the environment that reminds you to act. So an example of this plan might be, if I'm having lunch, take it outside and go for a walk at the same time instead of sitting in front of the TV. The situational context is having lunch and the behavior is going for a walk outside. But implementation intentions can also be like a when, where, how action plan that try to elaborate on the intention. For example, I could say on Saturday morning, walk from home to the cafe instead of driving. In that plan, I've identified when, where, and how I'm going to exercise. So action plans can be kind of like scheduling, as we've talked about just a moment ago, or they can be plans that are specifically designed to address barriers. Say nighttime TV is a particularly tempting distraction. You could say, if watching TV, do my abdominal workout during the ad breaks, or each night before watching TV, go for a walk with one of my family members. So there's lots of ways of setting action plans, but which ones work the best? Before we answer that question, we need to know whether they work at all. This video is based on a meta-analysis of 24 randomized controlled trials and quasi-experimental studies. The review generally compared implementation intentions to an active control condition rather than a no treatment control. 
This is really good for us because it helps to control for any placebo effect, so it strengthens the findings. The studies that were in the review included a mix of different implementation intentions, including some if-then ones and some when-where-how approaches. Some of them addressed barriers and some of them were just making plans. Overall, the authors found a small to medium pooled effect on exercise following these implementation intentions. The effect size was 0.31. This means these approaches do seem to help people translate intentions into behavior. The effect size at follow-up was still significant at 0.24, and so this means implementation intentions keep working even after the experiment's over. The action plans still have an effect after a long period of time. I know I keep swapping between the terminology implementation intentions and action plans, and that's because there didn't appear to be a difference between the different methods of setting plans. There was no significant difference between if-then plans and those that elaborated via when, where, and how people were going to exercise. Having said that, there was only a couple of studies that used if-then implementation intentions, so future research may find differences between these interventions. Similarly, the effect sizes were bigger for clinical populations and students than they were for the general population. There were only two studies on the general population, however, so we can't be sure that this finding is robust. What was more robust was the influence of addressing barriers with action plans. Compared with action plans that didn't address barriers, effect sizes were almost 50% higher for implementation intentions that helped people overcome possible hurdles that they were likely to face. Some people call these coping plans because they help us cope with possible threats. If the if refers to a barrier and the then refers to some way of coping, then the action plan is likely to be much more effective than those that simply schedule a behavior. When participants develop action plans by themselves, they seem to be almost as effective as those made with the help of a researcher. The effect sizes were a little bit higher when you had someone else's help, but even so, it seems that it's still effective to create an action plan by yourself following some simple instructions. This means that implementation intentions can be a cheap, time-efficient strategy that clients can do on their own if they're provided with the right framework. The studies in this meta-analysis aren't perfect. They often use poor, non-validated, self-report measures of physical activity. Nevertheless, it seems that using action plans can help people elaborate their intentions and address the barriers imposed by everyday life. Instead of just making an intention to go to the gym, people would be better off making clear plans about when, where, and how they're going to exercise. Even better, they could create coping plans to deal with the barriers to long-term adherence. Something like, if I'm too tired and I skip the gym, do a 10-minute hit session when I get home. This would help us overcome the barrier of fatigue that influences a lot of people. So instead of setting a New Year's resolution, perhaps people should start setting New Year's implementation intentions. I mean, I can't see why not. It's got a great ring to it.